Hello, hello. Welcome to the Five Talents Podcast. I'm your host, Abel Pacheco. I interview the top commercial real estate investors and industry experts so you can learn from their experiences. So if you're an investor, a high W-2 earner or real estate or tech sales professional that wants to invest in real estate without having to manage properties or leave your day job, then this podcast is for you. Or if you're already investing in real estate, but you're doing it part-time and you wanna become a full-time multifamily or full-time commercial real estate investor, this podcast is for you too. You're gonna learn a ton. You will learn from real life multifamily investors and other professionals in the industry. They're gonna share their blueprints for success and I'm super excited that you're here. So I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, hello. This is Abel Pacheco, your host for the Five Talents Podcast. We are super excited today because we have an amazing guest, Mr. Mikey Taylor. Uh, he is a former pro skateboarder turned entrepreneur. So we have uh, the the pleasure of having him today for a podcast interview. Mike, how's it going, brother? I'm doing well, Abel. How are you? Yeah, pretty good, man. I'm, I'm doing excellent. Thanks for asking. Good. And if you don't know Mike, he, uh, when I say former pro skateboarder, he spent some time in, in that world and along the process, you know, realized that he's, he's got to go create something afterwards and during and, and made an amazing go of it. He is a co-founder or was a co-founder and president of St. Archer as a craft brewery. And then also he's a co-founder and president of Commune Capital. And they have about $160 million of assets under management. So that's 160 million, if you didn't catch that number, 7,000 self-storage units, a few, you know, a couple hundred of apartment units. And they're also working on a mall conversion. So in the process of, of doing that, and there's like 800 units, it's crazy. So we're going to have a fun conversation for you. But uh, Mike, let me turn it over to you, man. What, in your own words, tell us who you are and what you do, and let's just start a great conversation, brother. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Mikey Taylor. Uh, I started off as pro skateboarder. I was kind of the kid who uh, picked up a skateboard because I saw one of the cool kids riding one, and I just wanted to fit in. And that very quickly uh, took over my life. I became consumed with it and just didn't want to stop. Uh Right around that time is when my parents started putting pressure on me to get a job. Uh, I wasn't ready to work. So uh, I came up with a plan to get co- to have companies give me free product uh, and then, you know, sell that product to my friends so that I wouldn't have to work so I could keep skateboarding. And that eventually just turned into a career, which was, uh, you know, a dream come true. The challenge to it was I couldn't skate forever. And so I had to figure out what I was going to do next and, uh, you know, had great guidance and people around me to, you know, help, you know, create this, uh, I would say, outlook to try to capitalize on uh, the moment. And, and, you know, when I was in influential, taking that to then put myself in a bigger position after skateboarding, that's kind of when entrepreneurship started. And, you know, fast forward 15 years later, now I'm here, <laughs> you know, I sit on the private equity side of real estate, which if you would have asked me 20 years ago, I would have said, no, <laughs> I, uh, you know, <laughs> like private so, equity, what I'm, I'm a skater. Well, that's, awesome, I would add, yeah, I, I wouldn't even known what that meant. So yeah, yeah, crazy journey I've had, uh, and, and thankful for it so far. Yeah. When I was a kid, I always wanted to be a pro skater. My friend, uh, I don't know if he's on and we're connected. My friend, Andrew Singler, uh, we were in the third and fourth grade. His dad built him a half pipe in his backyard. And yep. it, was a, it was a huge pipe. It took up the entire backyard. It was just wood. Uh, and anyways, we would we'd go ride his half pipe like all freaking summer long every weekend. And I tried like hell every, every time I dropped in, I would always like wipe out. I'd have to start in the middle and, and then work my way up. But uh, you know, those were dreams only. And, and after, I don't know, fifth, sixth grade, you know, start, I kind of stopped skating and then uh, you know, went, went on about my normal life. Right. Uh, Which was not the professional skater route. So let me just, before we get into this real estate part, there's, there's so much to this story that I'm ready to jump into. And part of it is, man, you never let go of your dreams, brother. You, you know, you, it sounded like you didn't intentionally go that route, but 
I mean, you wanted to skate. That's what you wanted to do. I didn't want to get this nine to five job. Your parents are pushing into it. And that in itself is like super hard to, to say you actually did what you were still doing or what you still wanted to do as a kid and you actually made it happen. So just tell us, give us a few bits of wisdom of this part. Like what, what was that journey about, man? Uh, okay. So uh, even you just asking, it brings back so many memories. Like, you know, my pain, like, look at this, this was, you know, almost 20 years ago now. And yeah. it was at the point where, uh, at least from what I believed, and my parents are pretty, you know, on the same page as well. If you didn't go to go to college, you weren't really going to be successful. Like that, that was kind of the ongoing message. And I totally believed it as well. So the hardest part was my parents were really, really concerned about me not going to college and me going into skateboarding. That was probably the biggest crossroads, at least for us collectively. And then even like me making that decision, like, Dude, I was concerned also, uh, but I just felt like, you know, I, there was something that I was so passionate about. I was obsessive, obsessive about it. There was an opportunity that kind of presented itself. And I just figured, you know what, why not go for it? Like, this is one of those moments, like you were kind of referring to, it's like a one, once in a lifetime opportunity that most people don't get. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to live this up three years. I'm going for it. <clears throat> if it doesn't work out well, what's stopping me from coming back and, you know, taking more of the conventional path was kind of my outlook. And then it just, you know, kept going longer and longer and longer. But uh, dude, it was, uh, you know, I skated every single day, all day for 20 something years. I never missed a day unless I physically couldn't do it. It was, uh, I was all in from the second I woke up to, I went to sleep. It was mastering my craft. So it, it, dude, it was a blessing, but it was a very obsessive journey as well. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, and we hear skater, you know, skateboarder and we're like, yeah, okay. Skateboarder. But when you're a professional doing what you do, you're, you're at it every, like you said, every single day, morning and night, and I'm physical part of it, your, your actual craft, your journey, you know, it's, it's like any other skill you have to hone it and you have to be yeah. really great on it. Uh, gr- great at it. You know, I've heard that saying, uh, in the professional world, somebody told me this about, uh, and when I say professional, W2 professional working job, they say the difference between a pro and an amateur is the amateur will practice until they get it uh, right. And a professional will practice until they can't miss or they can't get it wrong. And yeah. that's kind of what I thought about you. It was like, hey man, you just, you, it wasn't, a, I got it. I got it once. I got it. I'm going to get this deal. I cannot miss. I cannot miss this trick or whatever you're doing, right? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, dude, it was great. It it, it was, it was such a cool experience. There is so much, I I mean, even to this point, like the most impactful life lessons I learned were through that time as a skateboarder. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely kind of molded me, uh, in a lot of regards to, you know, who I am today. Yes. And that's a lot of years you had your friends, your best friends, brotherhood, uh, business professionals all mixed together. Right. I mean, all that. Yeah, that's right. It's actually absolutely right. So, so what is the money like as a professional skateboarder? Not like it is as a baseball player or basketball player. Uh, uh you didn't it, get a $30 you know, million dollar sign on bonus, huh? Yeah, no. The first year <laughs> I decided to be a pro skateboarder, I was making, I think like 800 bucks a month. Uh, and then it took me about, let's see, five years of being a pro skateboarder until I started making a hundred grand a year. And at that point I was like, here we go. Like a hundred grand a year on 24. Like I am slaying it. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then I kind of sat at that kind of stage for a while. Uh, And then the end of my career, the last four years or so is when I started making uh, a pretty good amount of money. And that's because I had a signature shoe that just started selling like crazy. So I started seeing uh, royalties at a, at a, you know, an amount that was just much larger than that. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. But for, for everybody, kind of just so they have context of what pro skateboarders make, the average income for a pro skateboarder is probably about 60 grand a year is average. Uh, I was a little bit above average as far as pay scale goes. Uh, and then there's a very small few that make a lot of money. Over a million is a very small few. Mm-hmm. I never got to that small few. I had to do it the alternative route. Yeah. And, and there's also, uh, I would say a couple of lessons probably in this is 
uh, what I'm hearing is everybody that has a, an amazing skill gets after it can kind of get in at this 60 K level. Uh, and then once you're in, you also have to take it up to another work level. I'm assuming to get to that hundred K and that's somebody like you Monday through Sunday. It sounds like morning till night skating and practicing and, and working it, making it happen. But then you transition to where you had a shoe deal. It's kind of what it sounds like. And in that position, it kind of went from trading time for money now in this ability to uh, cr create some extra income without your additional time and effort and energy. Right. Uh, no, <laughs> unfortunately, you want to tell no. me, man, any, any insight no. you want to give us, give us brother. Basically so. how, I mean, the easy answer is yes. But when it, when it comes to selling product, like in theory, I could have not skated for a whole year and still made money. So there was this, you know, residual component to it. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is that wasn't going to last for five or 10 years out. So it was the idea of like, I have to maintain this same energy so mm -hmm. that I'm able to keep up demand so that I can keep selling shoes down the road. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so it was, it was a very much active grind. Oh, it was, dude, it was active until my career ended. It was okay. all the way through. Um, so yes, but it was a new revenue stream. Got it. That makes perfect sense. And at what point did it, I don't know, dawn on you or when, when did you realize, Hey, this is something I've got to prepare for after skate, after skateboarding. When, when was that? How old were you? So, so uh, okay. When I told my parents, like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be a pro skateboarder. Right. Yeah. 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 And they went, no, you're not, you are going to college. And this became the whole thing. Right. Uh, what we ended up coming to was, okay, I'm going to do this for a few years. Let me kind of go for it. And their requirement or, or what they strongly wanted me to do was get help financially. And they were really concerned um, on what this meant for my future, because, you know, what does it even mean to be a pro skateboarder? They ended up connecting me with one of their uh, friends, but uh, there was somebody who managed my parents' money. And they were like, you're going to speak with him and he's going to help you kind of create this foundation. And remember, I'm not making a lot of money. When I walked into his office, yeah. dude, it was like barely over a thousand bucks a month. He's like, <laughs> you know, but thankfully he kind of took me under his wing uh, wow. like from a mentor standpoint and spent time with me, kind of educating me on finance, helped me create a discipline before I was making a lot of money. And then also started educating me on how money worked and how I needed to start preparing for my future, uh, which was a little bit challenging because again, I wasn't making that much money. Uh, and so I was very aware of it uh, really early on that I didn't know what the rest of my life was gonna look like. Uh, the entrepreneurship came later down the road. Like my original plan through skateboarding was live like I'm broke, maximize the amount of money that I can put into opportunity that's gonna help my transition and just be very, very disciplined the whole way through. That was my whole approach until I turned 26, 27 and kind of, you know, got this bug up my butt that I wanted to start business. That's when the plan started changing. But up until that, I thought it was just going to be skate my brains out and be very smart with how I invest passively so that I could get to a point where I get to choose to work and not have to. Yeah. Uh, just slight detour halfway through. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank God for uh, parents wisdom. Uh, yeah. A mentor that knew or was was good at uh, helping a young person become mm -hmm. financial literate, uh, financial literate, and having literacy in in this area is kind of what I'm hearing, right? Huge, uh, huge blessing. I mean that 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 moment, my parents basically, you know, recommending me to do that, and then his name was Randy. Randy coming into my life that that changed the trajectory of my future. That was huge, huge turning point for me. So uh, forever yeah. grateful for that moment. Yeah. It really could have been anything at this point, whether it's skateboarding or a W2 after college, uh, the, the sooner you learn some of those principles on assets and liabilities and income and expenses. And here's your, you know, here, here's the ability to earn after, or when you're not working, right. Those assets, I, that's, that's the light bulb moment, I think for a lot of people. And, uh, for somebody like me, man, I, it took me a little while longer. I was, I was uh, 26 when I first read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but it wasn't until like 
I really, really started like in the, in my mid thirties that I go, I should probably look at my net worth and look, look at this assets, minus liabilities thing. But uh, right. anyways, man, kudos. And what, what insights did he give you? Do you think you can share with uh, every, everyone, every one of our listeners that you think would apply across all situations? In the beginning, like what would like the found the fund, fundamentals? Sure. What a, it, oh yeah. man, the, the biggest ones for me were, and I know this sounds like a, a very basic concept that everybody knows, but spend less than you make. We all say it, you have to uphold it. Uh, the second thing was creating the discipline before I was making a lot of money. So it's the idea of learning to be responsible with little so that you can be responsible with a lot. And what that did for me was once I understood and created the discipline, I was able to control my lifestyle as I started making more money. So the, the challenge that we all face is we make more money, we spend more money. But if you can control lifestyle inflation, as you start making more money, that's where things really start getting powerful because our income is our greatest wealth building tool. But we have to have the income to then deploy into assets and so that kind of fundamental belief, create the discipline, control lifestyle, maximize opportunity uh, was a huge one for me. Uh, learning about investing in yourself, uh, that was a game changer. And, you know, when he told me that you need to learn how to invest in yourself, I, I didn't understand what it meant. And, you know, he would say things like, look, if you invest in yourself, that will always be your greatest return. What does that mean? Well, yeah, yeah. how could we put dollars into adding more value more skill, more demand to yourself, which will then turn into sponsors paying you more money, however we look at it. And then it was like, ah, okay, well, I'm going to go get this building with some friends. We're going to build this private skate park in it. We're going to have a training facility. I'm going to get better. You know, more kids are going to want to uh, buy my product. It's going to make more money. And it was just a, uh, almost introducing this entrepreneurial viewpoint as a pro skateboarder. Uh, was a big one. And then the other one, which was probably huge that I realized uh, in the financial crisis, 2007, 2008, was sticking to your buy-sell discipline always. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big, big one for me. So he, in the beginning, started working with me on creating my you know, risk tolerance and my goals, how I was going to invest, when I was going to buy, when I was going to sell. And that felt really easy when times were good when the whole you know, floor fell out, that's when it was like fear started coming into you know, my decision-making. And it was like, oh my gosh, we need to sell. I'm losing everything. And to have him go, no, we plan for these moments. This is actually when we buy and to have guidance through that and then experience what my, my kind of three, four years through and after looked like in the you know, 07, 08 issue was way different than what everyone around me experienced. And then it was like, ah, emotion and discipline, that is the game here. So I would say those were kind of the, the big ones for me with him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then my introduction into real estate was with him. My oh. first investments that I was making passively was with him as well. well let's talk about so those, he, man. This is a great, yeah, he, well, before yeah. you move on to that, you know, the, these are just amazing points. So let me just, you know, make sure to spend less than, uh, then you make basic, but very absolute 100% fundamental on this. Uh, the discipline to, to kind of stay this course, whatever the course you said, uh, I like the controlling your lifestyle, right? It's, Hey, I, that's along the, the mindset of spending less, um, than you make and being able to yeah. budget and stick within it. And then, you know, not living outside of your means and also the risk tolerance part of it. Yeah. That's like, what, what are we doing? How are we doing it? Uh, I'm investing my dollars here. And then when you have this downturn 2008, when everything's going crazy, he's, he's the one advising you, no, 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 this is a great time to buy. Now's the time. Yeah. Let's get after right. it. So those that's are right. great lessons. Thank you so much. So that's so right. He was your first uh, foray into the real estate side, I guess, for passively anyways, it sounds like. Yep. Yep. So man, yep. let's, let's break in a great commercial real estate. How in the world do you start from passive and go to what, you know, $160 million at AUM today and converting them all. So let's just take hey. it a bit at a time, man. Okay. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> going back to like my original plan, it was mm -hmm. put all of my energy towards my craft, which was skateboarding to mm -hmm. maximize the amount of money I could make here so that I could then maximize the amount of money I could put into assets that would help my transition. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, the hard thing about real estate is I didn't make enough in the beginning to participate. It's kind of, you know, the, 
thousand bucks a month and I got up to $2,500 a month, that's very hard yeah. as far as an income standpoint goes to get into the real estate world. It, it does have a high barrier to entry. So I was able to build this kind of call it war chest of capital as I was going through these years of just living off barely anything of what I made. And then my first opportunity to invest was through him. And that was in the storage in storage units. And so uh, at that time, uh, I didn't understand much about it. Like, you know, I had such good experience with him that, and I had built so much trust that I was just like, Randy, how does this work? And he was like, look, dude, we buy these distressed buildings. We convert them into storage units. Uh, okay, well, how do I get paid? Right. And he's like, look, you're going to invest your dollars in. There's going to be a dark period during construction. Then we bring tenants in. Then we rent it out. Then there's cash flow. And then you get to participate. And I was like, okay, cool. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> invest, invest a little bit at the time. I think my first investment was like 25 grand, which was a lot back then. But yeah. in the world of real estate now, it's a smaller, smaller investment. Uh, and I was like, oh, let's see how this goes. And all of a sudden, I start seeing, you know, my quarterly dividends and then there's a refi moment. I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. And yeah. what was interesting is I was participating in kind of more of the conventional past prior to real estate. I yeah. was in the stock market. I was in bonds, just funding my IRAs, right? I was making passive income there. Yeah. I just didn't realize it was happening until real estate. There's something about real estate that felt very simple for me to understand and seeing, you know, the cash flow coming in and then these big bumps, if there was ever a capital moment on a refire sale, it was just like, ah, this is how I do it. Even though yeah. I had a bigger system in place on kind of getting to financial freedom or financial independence, real estate was the very simple one where I went, that's how I do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, lo I love that story. I, I mean, this is awesome because uh, well, so many people that are listening to this, I'm sure they're, they're saying something similar, which is, I, I love it. That's probably why they're listening to our podcast. Uh, yeah. we've had a hundred and something shows and, uh, we just hit 31,000 downloads, uh, oh, this week. Congrats. Uh, we started in September. So I go, okay, well, I think this is a good, a good, a good track. And, uh, they heard what you're saying right now. I know they did. And they're like smiling ear to ear as well, because, for somebody like me, I did the same. You know, this is what I what I was supposed to be doing. My parents said, "Go to college, go to work, get a good job." And I thought this is the only path. And then I'm going to supposed to save my money, 401k. Our tech job did well. You know, it, it did go pu public and all this stuff. And I had a, a good run. But then I go, "This is awesome as far as work." But if I stop working, my income stops coming in. What the heck is going on? And all of a sudden, real estate was there. And it just made sense. It was very simple yeah. for me to go, oh, this is one of those products that everybody's going to need forever. And <laughs> if I invest a little for the long term, it's still going to be there in the long term. And, you know, yeah. I just need to keep feeding it. So this, is, this has been re really awesome. Hello, hello. You're listening to the Five Talents Podcast. I'm your host, Abel Pacheco. If you're enjoying this podcast, then I know you're serious about achieving financial freedom. Are you ready to create your own path through multifamily investing for yourself and your family? Then I know you're going to appreciate our investor's guide to multifamily investing. It's titled Tackling Commercial Real Estate the Easy Way. We use this guide to invest ourselves in $93 million worth of real estate. So we're going to show you the basic mechanics of multifamily syndications and how to evaluate your next passive investment opportunity. So the best part, if you subscribe to our podcast now, leave us a review and a rating. I'm going to give you a free copy of our ebook. So please take a moment to do that now. Once you've done that, go to 5tcre.com forward slash ebook, 5tcre.com forward slash ebook. Make sure to let us know you left a review and we're going to send you a free copy. So thank you so much for subscribing to the Five Talents Podcast. We really appreciate it. And then um, your transition, when did you go from passive to active? How many years were you investing either passively or how many deals did it take you? And wh what was your first, you know, transaction? And then maybe take us here, you know, on. Okay. So uh, I was investing passively for 
oh man, a little over 10 years. Uh, and That's a, and what That's happened, a long time. It was a, it was a, it was a good little run. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what happened to me was, and, and I got to tell this story because it'll make more sense going into the transition. Please. Uh, my wife had a conversation with me uh, right when we, we got married. And she was like, hey, look, I know that you're really disciplined on the financial side. I know you have your plan financially, but like, what are you going to do after skateboarding? Like, mm -hmm. she started asking me these questions and she was like, look, you don't have to figure it out right now. I just want you to start thinking of what's next and what can you do in this moment that will then allow you to do something else afterward, right? And I was like, you know, a little bit annoyed. We The, the conversation turned into a fight in the beginning. Uh, that yeah. usually happens when I know she's right and I don't want to hear it. What a and great basically, wife. What a great wife. She really, really, blah. I married up, oh, tenfold. So basically I then took that the next week and was like, I need to figure this out. I need to figure this out. Again, the obsessive, um, you know, personality. And so I would start having conversations with my friends and every time they would say something, I would say, we need to do a business. We need to start a company. Right. So one of my friends who's like one of the most famous skate photographers, uh, in the world, uh, we were both writing for this company called OGO it was a backpack company. Yeah. They yeah ended up, OGO. Right. Okay. So they ended up dropping their skate program. We lost our backpack sponsors. Yeah. And he was like, hey, dude, we need to find new sponsors. I was like, no, we don't. We need to start a backpack company. So that was like, okay, let's do a backpack company. And then two weeks later, I'm with a friend and we're talking about like, you know, businesses within skateboarding. And he throws out, dude, we should do a craft brewery. Yes, we should. Let's start the business. Thank God he was as crazy as I was. And then yeah. the next day that began the journey of us trying to figure out how to create a craft brewery. So that one was actually the one that stuck for us. We spent about a year trying to figure out what that meant. Uh, and this was my two partners. One of them was my childhood best friend who was a pro skateboarder. The other was a surf filmmaker. We had no business experience. Uh, and so I called Randy, my mentor. Randy, yeah. can we get together with you? We have an idea and we don't know how to make it happen. And he says, yeah, look, come meet up. So we pitch him this idea. And he's like, okay, well, where's your guys' business plan? We're like, dude, this is why you we're just with heard you. it. You just heard we it. We don't know what a business plan is. Like, right. Yeah. And so he ended up helping us create the business plan. We realized that we were going to need capital to start our business. We, we didn't have enough, us three. And he kind of started going through the education component with us on how we pitched an investment, the questions investors were going to ask us, how we needed to respond to build confidence for them to give these three kids their money to start a business that we had no idea how it was going to work, et cetera. And so we ended up starting that business, uh, had a lot of success with it. We sold it to Miller Coors about three and a half years after we started. That's awesome. Uh, it, amazing. Right. It was a total blessing. And now when the transition comes, so we sold the company, my career pretty much ends right around that time. And I had become one of really three pro skateboarders that were financially independent and were able to choose what they wanted to do next. Most skateboarders, the transition is call a sponsor they once had, see if they can work in the warehouse. Maybe they can be a team manager and stay within the industry. And uh, mine was just different. And I was thankful for that opportunity, but also felt kind of a component of survivor's guilt. Like, my whole community, why am I the one over here? And all my friends aren't. And so as I was starting to work through that, along with the kind of insecurities of a pro athlete's career ending and having to work through identity and purpose and kind of navigate through that mess, uh, I came up with this idea of trying to help more and more of my friends be in the position that I was in only because I had great guidance when I was young. And ultimately wanting to recreate what Randy did in my life for others. And so I had this idea to start this company. And so I basically build my business plan because at this point I know how to start business. Uh, I wanted it to be two components. One, I wanted to educate people on financial literacy because the empowerment that Randy gave me on educating me was the tools I needed to then apply action, right? The second thing he gave me was opportunity. I was able to participate in opportunity with him. And when I started thinking about the opportunity, at least from the big bulk that my portfolio was investing in, I was investing in assets that were risk adjusted. It was a risk adjusted return 
so that I could count on that money being there when my career ended, right? And so I wanted it to be in real estate, even though I had come from, you know, the startup world and, you know, we raised money for, for St. Archer, had a humongous exit. That was such a high risk investment that yeah. most people that were investing with us, we would say, just put in a little bit, you know, put in an amount that you can feel comfortable losing in case we do. Well, when I started looking at assets to help help skaters truly transition, I didn't want to take on that much risk and why I made my way back to real estate, wanting, wanting the opportunity in my company to be real estate focused. And so in my business plan, I wanted to create a fund. I didn't understand how fund management worked. And so I called Randy. Randy, it's happening again. I'm getting together with you. Sit in his office, give him my business plan. He's asking me questions about it. I give him the whole rundown and I tell him, look, I, I know how to bring this to life. I don't know fund management. Who do I need to bring into my circle to help build this out so that I could build my vision out? And he goes, dude, I've known you for 20 years. We helped you get St. Archer going. You guys took that off and were, you know, had huge success with it. Instead of me telling you who to go hire, why don't we have a conversation about partnering together? Like, dude, it's been 20 years. Yeah. And so that conversation led to uh, us eventually starting a company together about a year later. And we started it in multifamily. We started a management company, uh, a new portfolio that was going to focus on kind of these deep, deep value add plays in apartments. And then we, all of our social media was going to be directed towards education. So the education component, the opportunity component. And that's how the transition eventually started. Uh, and then what was kind of unique or what ended up happening is all of their business that they had built prior to the company we started was all a very like grassroots organic style of growth. Like they did such a good job on performance and such a good job on the experience that they had investors that would tell other investors about them. And then the thing would start growing and growing and growing, right? Well, the approach I wanted to take was very similar to what we did with St. Archer. And I kind of left this part out, but when we built St. Archer, we looked at the industry of craft beer and everything was product driven, right? It was all about infusing some, you know, unique fruit or some specialized hops into this product. And then that would be the driving force to then generate sales. And we went in and went, no, we're actually going to create a brand. We're going to create a story. We're going to create something that, that makes you experience something different than the beer. It wasn't about the liquid. It was about the experience, right? And that was a big driving factor of why our business became so successful. And then we use that with, you know, social media in 2012, influencer marketing before influencer marketing was a thing and the thing erupted. So I wanted to take that same approach to real estate where I wanted the product to almost be secondary to the experience that people were having while investing with us. And I wanted social media to be the way that I grabbed people and then brought them into experience, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so what we started seeing was a very different style of growth from the new company we started versus the other two that they had built, call it the more conventional way. We started seeing deal flow from brokers as if we had a 10 year relationship with them we didn't know them at all. And all of a sudden had access to off-market deals. So we were skipping the trust build phase when it mm -hmm. came to brokers. Yeah. We had investors coming in digitally that we didn't know. It was like opportunity started coming so heavily at us that we ended up having a conversation with one another about, call it, I don't know, 16 months ago about merging our companies together. And then we ended up bringing them all together. So the management company that we created the management company they created that I was passively investing in became one. And then the brand that we started together then went on a rebrand for the other two portfolios. And now we have uh, three total portfolios in the company through this merger. So we went from, you know, uh, four partners, about 70 investors, uh, and maybe a team of seven uh, to about 500 investors, a team of 15 uh, and just our resources became much greater. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. What an amazing story, man. There's, there's so much in here. Uh, I'm excited just to, to spend some time with you, Mikey. It's, it's really, it's really amazing. So a couple points for those listening, the power of a team is absolutely cr critical. 100% uh, 
on you know everything that I heard all the way through uh, from from early on till his first startup to exit to the bigger dream to the bigger one. It's man, you're leveraging the your network and the people that you have a direct connection with. They know you, like you, trust you. We've got amazing uh, relationships in all of our own networks. You need to really know who you know, like start to know who you know. And uh, I think that was amazing. I love the way you kind of put together your portfolio with the, the social media part in 2012. Today, it's kind of like, yeah, we should do some social stuff. But in 2012, giving that education out, building up your uh, it, it helps. There's this book, uh, I forget which book it is, but it's the speed of trust was basically sped up so much with investors, brokers, people, you know, probably your partnerships, you know, all the way through, uh, the long-term relationship with Randy was already established, but at some point he's like, what are we doing? Like, you need to come, we need to work together. <laughs> I've seen you crush it. I helped you crush it. Let's go crush it together. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. There's so many That's things right. there. There's so many, uh, and then uh, hey, well, oh, go ahead, go ahead, you go ahead. Hey, well, I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna echo what you just said because it, it is really powerful. Uh, the trust component, especially when you're in in the world that we're in now, people mm-hmm. want to work with you, whether that's brokers, investors that are going to invest with you. Trust is everything, and <clears throat> think about how long it takes to build trust with somebody in person. I mean, dude, you're calling them all the time, you're spending time with them, right? Social yeah. media allows you to do it to a ton of different relationships all at once it, it, it's just it has completely sped it up so i would recommend anyone who doesn't use social media as a trust builder to use it it's it's powerful yeah. it really is i i saw this somewhere on social i don't know where but it was uh they said think about the amount of trust it takes for somebody to invest fifty thousand dollars which is a typical minimum on our deals they go a lot of times you'll see someone uh, ask for a referral for a babysitter, for example, and there's more trust than saying, oh, uh, who are you? What do you do? How many kids have you took care of? Okay, I'm going to drop my kids off with you tonight and I'll be back and I'm going to go pick them up later. You, there's less due diligence giving, like dropping off some kids at the babysitter than there is for $50,000 amount. So I, I thought about that. I go, I'm not going to leave my kids with a babysitter like the same way. I do. But man, it's uh, it's it's a lot of trust that happens for that yeah. 50K. It's harder, harder right. to pass with that than it is my kids at a, at a babysitter's. Anyways. That's right. Um, th- yeah. So, and then also for those that don't uh, know the word fund, it's, it, you know, in a syndication model, it, let's say it's one particular asset. We're raising capital. We're putting it together. We're buying one deal, a fund. It, it is bigger because you can do more things with it. You can have it ongoing. You could buy multiple assets. You can invest in different things. There's even more trust there because it's not one particular asset that we've already got under contract. It's like, Hey, trust me, I'm going to find good deals. <laughs> so it, there's a lot more built up there, which Mikey That's and right. his team have developed over time. And it, That's and right. then also, also, it's not a quick thing. People, you know, people see 160 AUM it didn't happen overnight. So it's just amazing. Hey, before we go, uh, it, uh, if our investors, people want to reach out to you, what's the best place to get into your world and who, who do you want to reach out to you and where should they go? Uh, that's a great question. So if you want information on our company or want to uh, start following along the journey, just on the financial literacy side, uh, our website is communecapital.com. On all of our social media platforms, it's Commune Capital. Uh, and then if you want to connect with me personally, uh, Mikey Taylor on all the platforms. You search it, it'll come up. Um, and I would say from a, you know, an investor standpoint, uh, you know, just to kind of give everybody a little bit more uh, detail on what we do, uh, we repurpose a big box retail that goes vacant and repurpose that into storage units. Uh, our other platform, we're doing something similar, but we're targeting malls. So when a mall goes dark, we're looking at uh, buying a, a real distressed asset in an area where a community does not want that asset there and repurposing it into apartment buildings. Uh, and then our third portfolio is a lending portfolio. So we have something for somebody who just wants cash flow and wants to maybe bring some of risk down. We have on the other end, a big value add play where you have the potential to gain a lot of appreciation. And then we have a, a portfolio in the middle for kind of a hybrid of both. Yeah, that is awesome, man. So 
uh, we, we had a few minutes to talk about this mall uh, conversion. So I, if you've lear- heard of more than a few of our podcast uh, interviews, you know, I worked at Rackspace, we're a big tech company, went from 500 employees to like 6,000. And what uh, Graham Weston, the founder and some of the, you know, the, the, the founders there, they decided to buy a mall in San Antonio, Texas, a distressed uh, property that was no longer in use for a number of years. And they took it and they gutted the thing. And then we started in the Sears building is where we started our first little location. And then they kind of expanded out. And then Mikey, you guys are doing the same, but in multifamily, right? That's that's right. That's exactly right. I know. But I mean, dude, everybody knows it. Like everybody recognizes that there's a big change happening through retail, right? Yep. We saw it 2008, 2007, 2008 with kind of the boom of e-com and uh, how the buyer experience was changing. Uh, and then COVID hit, it, it, it sped it up. So it's like, we know that there's an issue happening with these big malls, at least in the, in the, class C, class B area. And everybody's trying to figure out what to do with them. And so we have kind of located what we think is the best way to do it. Uh, There's other groups that are trying to kind of reinvent the mall experience entirely, leave them as a mall, but, you know, try to make it more current on what the, I would say, Gen Z millennial generation want. Uh, But like we're not in the business of mall. All the entertainment and that kind of stuff. Yes, but we're not, look, malls are not our specialty. Like we focus on apartments and storage. So our plan is <laughs> buy the dead thing and convert it into something that has higher demand, you know, very simply put. No, that's awesome, man. Well, I'm excited to stay connected to you, see some drawings and some architect stuff around that conversion. And uh, mm. yeah, this is really cool. Well, Mike, is there anything we didn't talk about today that you wanted to bring additional exposure or anything I didn't, you wanted me to ask, I just didn't get to anything in general? Um, I would say the only, uh, I guess we could leave it on this one for, for anyone who <clears throat> is not invested in real estate yet, uh, set your goals for it, put a timeline together and start driving towards participating because it is one of those asset classes that is very easy to understand, can really, really change your life in the sense of freeing up time. And can really big a, be a big blessing on you know your kids and the generations after. So get involved. If you're not yet, just l- let's buckle down, make it happen. It, it is one of those asset classes that could be a life changer. Yeah, that is awesome. I'm super excited. Mikey, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I want to be, uh, be a good steward of it. And I can't use more than allotted. So thank you so much. I just sincerely appreciate it. If you've heard something that provided value today, go reach out to Mikey, get in his world, get in the social uh, go connect with him and, and talk to him in the future about some of the deals they're doing and uh, go to our podcast, subscribe and leave a written review, drop his name on there. If you heard it and uh, enjoyed it. So thank you so much, Mike, you're the man, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks, for your time. Abel. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the five talents podcast with your host, myself, Abel Pacheco. Each week, we're going to bring you interviews from industry experts and commercial real estate investors who followed their dreams and achieved massive success. Before you leave, let me ask you a few questions. Did you enjoy this episode? Did you learn something valuable? Was your mind stretched to what's possible and what you can achieve? Do you want other experts just like the one you heard today? If you answered yes to any or all of those questions, then please take a moment to subscribe to the Five Talents Podcast, give us a five-star rating, and most importantly, leave us a written review. Tell us what you liked. Tell us your favorite guest. Give us any feedback. I'm excited to learn and improve so you can get a more valuable show. So thank you again for subscribing to the Five Talents Podcast.